Thank you, Divya. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Are you guys having a good time? So like uh, Divya mentioned, today we're going to talk or discuss a little bit about hardware acceleration. And speaking about acceleration, how many of you guys know this guy? So this guy is probably competing with Hacker News with respect to how it decreases our productivity in the last couple of years. And if you, like many people, play this on your smartphone, today we have a very powerful smartphone that can play this game in many other more complicated games. And they all play the games very well. So animation is smooth, objects flying everywhere, no problem whatsoever. But then, did it ever occur to you why the same powerful smartphone struggle as you view web pages or even rich websites? So as uh, front-end developers, you might have got some tricks on how to improve the performance. How many of you are familiar with this Transat 3 tricks? Or even give that kind of advice? So throughout this presentation, uh, we're going to see that it takes more than just taking your magic wand and then cast the spell Translate 3D5 in order to speed up your user interface. So before I work at Sencha dealing with HTML5 and JavaScript development, I work on different different things from C++ multi-platform toolkit to WebKit. And then as I move to front end uh, to see how front end development works, I realized that sometimes there are gaps of knowledge here and there on how certain things work. And if, if we just know about this, then we will be uh, better prepared to handle all the intricacy of hardware accelerations. So uh, today I'm going to focus mostly on CSS3. Some of the principles, they're the same. So hopefully with some tweaks, you can uh, extrapolate it to, say, Canvas or SVG or even WebGL. So I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list what to do and what not to do with respect to optimization. Because if you follow uh, yesterday's talk or any other resource on the internet, then you get all these uh, kind of best practices. So use the internet, especially the web. Good luck if you're still using Gopher. Uh, what I'm going to show is uh, a little bit of a sneak peek what happens under the hood, and then what kind of tools and platform that you can utilize so that you can explore this uh, uh, by yourself. So speaking about hardware extortion on a web browser, we need to have a quick refresh first on how web browser works. This is just a 10,000 foot overview. Um, web browser is a, a complicated beast. It handles everything. Uh, that we can possibly imagine. Uh, probably the, the, the front uh, modules is networking because it's responsible to pull the bits and pieces uh, of the network server. And then all this contents needs to be fed to the uh, rendering engine. And if there's application logic written in JavaScript, the JavaScript engine needs to kick in and then carry out some execution. But at the end of the day, what you want from a web browser is that it transforms the contents, uh, the web content itself, into pixels that you can see on the screen so the user can consume it. So this is delegated to something called graphics tag. We're going to see what graphics tag is uh, in, in the next couple of minutes. So the web content itself is typically consists of either, uh, or not either, both HTML to define the contents and then style sheet to uh, set how, how would you would want, want the content to, to, to appear on the screen. So these two paths crosses as they reach uh, the, the monitor in, in form of pixels. So these are uh, a very high level overview of how uh, all those contents merge or converge at, at some point. So the DOM, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. These three classes are the actual WebKit classes names in the source code that maps to uh, the, the names of the DOM itself. So if you have a HTML content like this, then the browser needs to create the three data structures that maps to how the DOM is uh, structured. So there's also something called render tree. This is WebKit terminologies, uh, but I was told that uh, Firefox has the same thing under a different name. Uh, every render uh, box usually maps to a particular DOM node. And this render tree is the one that implements the full CSS uh, box model. So it handles everything from uh, hit testing, all the metrics, how you want to size it, position, et cetera, et cetera. So if you specify style after being resolved to a particular element, then there will be a corresponding render style, which roughly match to what you will uh, expect from a DOM element if you do a com get computer style. So these are all the ingredients that the browser needs to uh, 
display your web contents to the screen. Uh, typical optimization strategies to minimize the layout. Uh, we need to be careful and distinguish between style recalculation and layout. In the first example, I just changed the background color, so there's no need to move the element. There's no, there's nothing else changed except the color. So if you debug it using, say, Chrome DevTools or Web Inspector, you're going to see that the browser needs to recalculate the style once, and then just paint the new uh, rectangle corresponding to that color. Whereas if you change the position, then the browser needs to do something called layout. Some people call it reflow. I prefer the term layout because that's the term that is used in the CSS specification. And of course, if you move stuff, then there will be a new dirty rectangle that needs to be painted, and that's why usually it's larger than as if you don't do any uh, layout. That's an extensive list of uh, DOM elements that, if being touched, it will trigger layout. Uh, this is also a typical performance optimization that you need to do first. Make sure that there's no uh, unnecessary layout that tries your uh, performance. So CSS painting is complicated. How many of you here have read the full CSS specification? So it's, uh, it's fun. And all of this needs to be implemented in the browser, so everything from the background to selection and outline, uh, that's part of the, uh, the, the 10 stages of, of painting. Again, this is all done by the render objects. So I mentioned about graphic stack. Graphic stack is very platform dependent. Uh, on Mac OS X, uh, usually people use the core graphics, the legendary graphic stack that has been around for ages. And on Windows, we have GDI, and lately Microsoft uh, implements support for hardware extraction in Internet Explorer via the use of Direct3D or DirectX. And of course, we have uh, Skia, the Google rasterization engine that is used both in Android and Chrome. So unlike Unix, where everything is a file, uh, on a graphic stack, everything is a path. So path is a, the generic shapes. Everything else is just a subset of uh, a path. It's a generous form of a Bezier curve. In order to display a path, we need to stroke it, uh, which defines the outline of, of, of path, and we can also apply some brushes which fill the path. So it goes from the easiest one on the left side, which is no fill, to the most complicated one on the right side. And even if you see text in form of glyphs, uh, they look very smooth because uh, it, you look at it from a distance, but if you look closely, for optimization purposes, it's implemented by a series of approximated polygons. And of course, there's a complication with anti-aliasing because you want everything to look really smooth. That's why I'm excited with high-resolution uh, retina grade display everywhere because that uh, eliminates the need for a complicated cross-resistance algorithm. We can just get away without anti-aliasing. Transformation is very important because you want to uh, do certain operations that change the shapes uh, of the uh, objects or the path. And of course, these days, uh, most devices from phones, tablets, and uh, laptops, they all have something called graphics processing unit. This is a dedicated silicon floor uh, designed to perform uh, rendering pipeline. And the typical things is that it's optimized for parallelisms. So it supports fixed geometry and then applying some transformation and mostly for textural triangles because this is what people need for games. So historically, GPU is designed for uh, computer-aided drawing, and these days it's mostly optimized for games. So don't be shocked if, for example, your GPU is faster drawing texture triangles than drawing lines, because when was the last time you, draw, you see horizontal lines if you play Call of Duty? So a GPU workflow when you develop a game is that uh, you prepare some vertices, and then you say, hey, please apply this transformation. It could be matrix transformation. And then it's rendered to the screen, and then you probably want to apply some textures, uh, putting images on the surfaces, and then probably some lightings and other effects. So this is how people use GPU, and this is manifested in the way games is designed. If you see games, they are very bounded. Some games feel that the universe is very large, but they're not. So all the assets, they're known upfront. So let's see how uh, a web page rendering takes advantage of this GPU. First of all, we need to distinguish between games and web page because web page, they can be as simple as Google homepage or complicated as New York Times uh, news sites or other news sites, and they don't have predictable content. So the browser needs to deal with probably two kilobytes of contents to several megabytes if the site is really crappy. And on web page, you see mostly text. Uh, GPU is not necessarily optimized for text rendering. On games, you don't you don't see text much often. 
And of course, the initial response play an important role. If you uh, start to play Xbox game, you can wait a couple of seconds until the game starts, but you don't want to do that if you use web browser. So these are different uh, compromises that needs to be done with respect to the rendering. So how can we take the GPU that is optimized for games to do web page rendering? First, we need to be aware of all the limitations. Memory is always limited. This is uh, physical uh, problems. And speed as well, because GPU is not designed for general purpose computing. Some cases, uh, you can use the CPU to render things faster. And of course, there's always a bandwidth problem. The connection between GPU and CPU, they're not free. There's a small pipeline that connects both silicons, and they are not, uh, they are not a high bandwidth capacity of pipeline. And obviously, electron needs power, so as soon as you trigger this GPU, it requires uh, some energy. So if you want to apply, uh, if you want to find ways to have a fluid animation, we need to be aware of the strategies as we use it in games. So there are two stages. In the first stage, you try to push as many resources as possible to the GPU and, and hope that it stays there for a while. And then the animation is a matter of uh, manipulating those assets, manipulating those resources. This way, during the animation, we minimize the interaction between the CPU and GPU. So in the graphics world, there's something called immediate versus retain mode. In the immediate, which is on the left side, if you want to draw, if you want to animate some shapes, then you just do an animation loop and then draw the, sh the same shapes in different position. And if you do it very quickly, you have the impression that, oh, that, that, that box animates or moves. This is very inefficient. So an alternate way to do this is by using retain mode rendering, where you essentially capture that box or element or whatever shape you want, and then put it in a buffer. And then during the animation, you just move the buffer around. So one of the advantages is because the, the action of moving the buffer around or computing where I should put the buffer next, that can be done in a, in a completely different thread. So the animation mechanics will look like this. So the initialization steps, you need to do it once. If we have something that we want to animate, just render it as a texture. Texture is just a buffer on the GPU, and it consists of pixels and its values. And push it to the GPU, and then ask the GPU, hey, please keep it there and have the reference. And then during the animation step in your animation loop, you just apply a particular operations. So this operation is uh, just probably a few bytes, and it doesn't uh, clock the, the pipeline between the CPU and GPU. <clears throat> One of the common tricks is by taking elements and put it as a layer on the GPU. So this is a, a very nice example from WebKit that demonstrates the uh, smooth animation. So I can, as you can see, the, the leaves uh, fall down pretty smoothly. I'll explain what those boxes are in a couple of seconds. And this is done by pushing all the uh, leaves as a texture on the GPU. In fact, uh, what you see, uh, as I demonstrated this on my Safari, is that the logical 3D, or how you, put, how you view it from, from the top. So the GPU ha has all these layers, and they're uh, on top of each other. And then we just apply a particular matrix transformation to move the leaves around. This is something called compositing. And uh, this is the responsibility of a compositor to find out, to figure out what to do with uh, all those layers. So the twinning part, computing which position uh, you need to apply to each layer, is usually done on the CPU. In the actual operation, whether it's matrix transformation or something else, it's done on the GPU. Again, one of the benefits is that we can put the compositor on a different thread, and it will not block the main UI thread. By force, the typical way to uh, apply layers is using the Translate Z or Translate 3D that I mentioned uh, before. However, you don't necessarily need to do this if you already use CSS animation or CSS transition. So those Translate Z on my example is just very redundant. A modern browser will try to put the uh, uh, animated layer, animated element as a, as a layer in a compositing process. Now, let's see some, some tools and examples. So debugging all this compositing can be done by using Safari. Uh, and then if you, you run this first line on your terminal, suddenly your Safari has this magical new menu called debug that allows you to toggle the compositing borders. 
So the indicator of the compositing uh, is depicted in this uh, color-coded boxes. What, what is important is not the color itself, but rather the numbers, because the number represents the texture upload. What is mean by texture upload is how many times the browser needs to recapture your element, put it as a texture, and send it to the GPU. That's extremely important. So one thing that you can do to minimize texture upload is to only animate or transition a particular properties, such as opacity, position, size, and filters. This is what people usually call as a hardware accelerated CSS. If you try to do something else, then uh, the browser has no choice but to recapture your element and then upload the texture again. I'll give an example. This is a box that's moving from left to right and then gradually changes color uh, from green to blue. And you see that the numbers keep increasing. Every time the number increases, Safari needs to capture this and then send it again to my GPU. This is extremely uh, bad for, for the bandwidth between the GPU and CPU. If I add more boxes, then everything works like this. So. So even though we apply a translate 3D on this, each of this box, it doesn't help because we saturate the, the pipeline. In fact, if you do this on your uh, mobile devices, either it will crash or, or it will start to skip frames. So instead of gradual color change, you see blue and then suddenly green. So the browser enters some zone which I call as a micro frame second. So we're not talking about frame per second anymore. So transfer 3D doesn't help us in this case. What you can do to minimize texture upload is to use a particular, for example, transformation, because transformation is a matter of telling the GPU, hey, uh, you still have the same stuff, it's just uh, apply different transformation metrics. If you look carefully uh, on those uh, green boxes, the green the numbers, they, they are still the same even though there's a lot of animation happening there. You can also do a opacity change. For example, uh, this is a simple box that rotates and then changes opacity at the same time. And if you look closely, the number stays the same. It always says one. So there's no need for the browser to recapture the element and send it again to the GPU all the time. This is done uh, entirely on the, on the GPU. Very efficient. And you can build nice uh, education uh, interactive animation using uh, just opacity and then transformation. I hope you're hungry now. Probably one of the beautiful examples of how transformation can be used in CSS is uh, this 3JS examples. If you try to run this on your iPad or other tablets, it's, it's really smooth. And again, if you look carefully on those numbers on the corner, they're still the same. Even though I keep moving around, the sphere is rotating it like crazy. We can even apply a uh, transformation for this very nice example from Montage. As I move the poster on the reel, see that the numbers doesn't change. And let's have a look at the use of CSS for light lighting effect. Let me start with the lighting disables. Although this is a complicated form, let me choose this one. They're very fast to render, and it doesn't cause texture upload because uh, there's no change in lightning there. But as soon as I try to apply something, change the uh, color, then as you can see, there's an incredible amount of texture upload happening there.
How many, how many of you have seen this first person shooter demo with CSS 3D? That's pre pretty impressive actually. Again, the trick here is that if you look at this barrel, they consist of a bunch of elements and they don't necessarily uh, re-upload the texture every time and that's why it's pretty smooth. The funny thing is that the, the holding hand with the gun here, that keeps uploading texture for whatever reasons. And of course filter, as you can see from yesterday's filter labs presentation. There's also bad examples, not necessarily bad per se, it's just uh, not using uh, the uh, texture upload criteria very carefully. Uh, we'll see that in a minute. So how, what's the trick to uh, improve the performance? So as you can see, even if you have uh, the latest uh, luxury car from Lamborghini or Tesla, because we're in California, it doesn't help if you go into a freeway that it looks like a, more like a parking lot than a freeway. So the speed of your car doesn't necessarily mean that you get from point A to point B really fast. It depends on the uh, traffic situations. And this is what I, what I mean by the bandwidth between the CPU and GPU. So first thing, avoid overcapacity. Don't try to crazily set every element as a layer, either by using CSS animation transition, translate 3D opacity or any other properties, because that, that will just uh, saturate the, the bandwidth. Thing of the GPU is like a cache, and as you might already know, a, GPU, um, a fully saturated memory cache or disk cache uh, is a useless one. Prepare all the elements. Um, the movie show from Montage is a good example where you know if you swipe left or right, you're gonna see a particular poster on the left side and right side, so you can sort of prepare that upfront and then avoid uh, sending this texture right when the user uploaded. it. And of course, I mentioned about color transition. This causes uh, uh, texture upload, but there's a trick uh, to do that without uh, causing a texture upload. Now, if you do, if you do like this, then we saw that uh, it causes texture upload. But there's also a way to move the texture and then change the color. without causing the texture upload. This has been hinted in yesterday's presentation. So the trick is that you have to have two boxes and then vary the opacity b between them. So if they are on top of each other, then you have the impression that the color changes from one color to another colors. In this particular example, uh, by varying the opacity, we don't force the browser to send a new texture for every animation step. Of course, you can immediately see the drawbacks. We now need twice as much memory. So be advised of that. So when you play, uh, when you build games using CSS animation, sometimes the animation depends on the user input. For example, if you build a, a, a game using a ball and a pedal, where the ball move depends whether the user hit this or that. And uh, the way to respond to the user input is by uh, hooking yourself into the animation and event and then decide what to do next. This causes a problem because you will be impacted by at least two timer ticks because of the uh, callback and invoking the next animation. So one trick that we often use is to prepare both, to prepare both animation and at the same time uh, you decide w which one to get rid of by the time uh, you get the user input. So there's a lot of stuff that you can see from the hyperlinks. Feel free to explore them. Final words, uh, we have this powerful smartphone, so be careful on how to use this. I know you can tell so many things wrong with this poster. If possible, use CSS3, because then the browser can make all the crazy optimization, be it fast of texture upload. Always use your tools to find out what happens there. And traditional graphics programming, whether it's games or visualization, uh, it consists of full tricks, so don't try to find a, uh, a quick pen killer but try to understand the symptoms. So seek the truth, be creative, and build amazing web apps. Thank you very much.
don't think we have time for questions. Yeah, I had a question about um, a lot of times when I do animations, say, let's imagine we have a simple structure where it's like four divs stacked on top of each other and they they basically just have some simple text, like one line text in each one, right? And let's just say that you were to animate one of those boxes off to the side, like you flicked it off and then you would, you would reduce that height to, to make that stack now only show three, right? I noticed that a lot of times, I don't know if it's because of the way the browser is trying to restructure that uh, organization so that it causes it to kind of be choppy a lot of times or, or is it if you did position absolute and that way the, the browser would just use coordinate information to redraw that if that would be faster. Does that, am I making sense there? Whether the position is absolute or not, let's just get rid of the layout process. Yeah, would that, would that help it? Uh, if you change the text contents so that the elements gets bigger or smaller, then you we will be still impacted by the performance. So the best way is just to uh, run the compositing border and see whether the browser needs to capture that element again or not. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Is there any good resources for learning more about uh, all this uh, hardware acceleration stuff? This one? I'll put the slides online pretty soon so you can explore all the hyperlinks sprinkled throughout the slide deck. Okay. Thanks. All right. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>